I'm sure you've heard a lot about what's been happening in Venezuela. You've heard about Venezuela being described as a humanitarian catastrophe, a brutal dictatorship, a socialist dystopia. But is that true? And should we trust the same media outlets that have repeatedly sold us wars based on lies when it comes to Venezuela? I needed to see for myself, so I went to Venezuela for six weeks to find out the truth. What I saw in many ways shocked me because the reality was so different to the media hype. I was told that the government of Nicolas Maduro had effectively lost its support base and was running the country through an authoritarian dictatorship. I was told there was no food and that supermarket shelves were empty. Yet, on my first full day in the country, I saw a very different reality to what I was being told on the corporate and mainstream news. There were opposition marches for sure, but it seemed like pro-government supporters were basically ignored and made invisible by the mainstream and corporate media. Thousands of people had gathered at Bolivar Square in central Caracas, signing a declaration of peace and basically calling on the United States and its allies to keep their hands off Venezuela. Maduro, in my opinion, is president because of the elections that took place on the 20th of May. We are here for freedom and peace, for the freedom of Venezuelans, because the United States is attacking us militarily under the facade of humanitarian assistance. Maduro seems like God compared to Guaido, the devil, who is selling our nation for a few dollars. I soon realised that the supermarkets weren't empty either. Over the next few weeks, ordinary people to influential government officials all rammed home the same message. The Western media is lying about Venezuela. Viva Venezuela! Fearing for their lives, socialist dictator Nicolas Maduro claiming this evening that he has the military on his side, something that John Bolton just disputed. Uh, this is now, according to the U.S. officials who were on that flight, one of the largest displacements of people in the history of Latin America. Well, I think it's fair to say that uh, the international aggression against Venezuela has always marched in lockstep with a campaign from the international media. So what's really going on? Venezuela was propelled into the international news in January 2019, when the leader of the opposition-led National Assembly, Juan Guaido, declared himself the legitimate president of Venezuela a day after allegedly speaking to the United States Vice President Mike Pence. The declaration was soon recognised by around 50 UN member states, much to the dismay of the elected president Nicolas Maduro and his supporters. At this time, the USA is interested in acquiring Venezuelan oil, different minerals belonging to the Venezuelan state, and thus is declaring us to be ruled by a dictator. We, under our constitutional guarantees, have come onto the streets in peace. We've come onto the streets to fight for Venezuela, understanding that mobilization is the most powerful weapon we have as citizens to defend the revolution. The Western media tries to pretend that these people don't exist, but unfortunately for them, they do and they won't support a US-sponsored regime change. They're loud and proud and willing to defend their revolution. Was this a brazen US-sponsored coup attempt against a resource-rich, socialist-leaning democratic government or a constitutional transfer of power from an authoritarian regime aided by the international community? And has the Venezuelan government's failed policies led to it becoming a failed state? with a humanitarian crisis forcing millions to leave the country. Households were divided about the problems within Venezuela. I spoke to a father and daughter. The daughter was supportive of Juan Guaido, and the father was a government supporter and very much opposed to Guaido. The Venezuelans are wanting to get out of this problematic situation because we don't like it and we don't agree with all that is happening. A lot of people see the internal problems within the country and they criticize based on feelings. But feelings and intuition isn't enough. You have to see the facts and evidence. It was obvious there was a big division in the country. These political divisions played out through class and race. I found during my time in Venezuela that the poorer and darker a person was, the more likely they were to be a supporter of the government. 
and the wealthier and whiter they were, the more likely they were to be an opposition supporter. The building on the left is the Constituent National Assembly and it's dominated by government supporting officials. The building on the right is the National Assembly and it's dominated by opposition supporting officials. You can see the divisions within the political representation itself. This is an image of the opposition dominated National Assembly and this is an image of the government dominated Constituent National Assembly. I spoke to two Afro-Venezuelan women who were very concerned about what they described as a coup attempt by the white European elite class. We deserve to have conditions where we can have education, a place to work, that's our right. But unfortunately racism has its place and it exists in all parts but particularly amongst the right-wing opposition, so of course we are concerned. There was anxiety over the prospect of the right-wing opposition taking power because of the murder of Alanda Figuera, an Afro-Venezuelan who was passing through the opposition stronghold of Chacao. Orlando was assumed and then accused of being a government supporter because he was black and as a result was brutally beaten and set on fire by opposition activists. We live close to where Orlando Figuera died. We were close by and disruptions occurred. We had to run and take refuge in the metro and just leave the city. Much of the recent political controversy surrounds the 2018 Venezuelan presidential elections, when the opposition-led National Assembly refused to recognise the election victory of Nicolas Maduro, who got 6.2 million votes. They claim the electoral system, which former US President Jimmy Carter claimed was the best in the world, and which gave the opposition control of the National Assembly in 2015, was flawed, and therefore his presidential election victory was invalid. The US-educated Juan Guaido became the head of the National Assembly on January the 5th and declared himself president on the basis of Maduro's supposed illegitimacy on the 23rd of January. Interestingly, 81% of Venezuelans had never heard of Guaido before he declared himself the interim president of Venezuela. The self-declared president was soon recognised as the interim president by around 50 UN member states and they were soon demanding US humanitarian aid be allowed into the country. Vice President Pence announced approximately $60 million in additional aid and assistance. There are 193 UN member states. Only around 50 recognise Juan Guaido. 51 out of 54 African Union states do not, with the Kingdom of Morocco being the only exception. The majority in the Middle East do not recognise the self-declared president, with Israel being the only exception. In the Americas and the Caribbean, 17 nations back Guaido, but 19 nations do not, with the Caribbean in particular continuing their support for President Maduro. In Asia and Oceania, out of 33 nations, only Australia recognises Juan Guaido. It almost felt that the majority of UN member states, which were non-white, continued to back the elected president, Nicolas Maduro. Countries like South Africa have been very vocal in showing their support for the elected president, Nicolas Maduro. Solutions about problems of Venezuela lies with the people of Venezuela. It doesn't lie with somebody outside of Venezuela. What do you think motivates the international bodies and, and states to recognize Juan Guaido or to recognize Nicolas Maduro? Yes, in the case of the European Union, they have uh, proved that they are subordinated to the United States. You know? They may disagree on some topics, but when it comes to Venezuela, they absolutely do what President Trump wants them to do. The United States diplomacy is pressing every single country in this world, even Fiji, Palau, Vanuatu, they have told us you know, that they are under pressure as well, but the African countries as well. The, the, the ambassadors of the U.S. go to the ministries of foreign affairs and they press in order for them to recognize this fellow as president of Venezuela. However, right-wing Latin American states were giving their full support to the self-declared president Juan Guaido with Colombia leading the pack and demanding that the Venezuelan government allow in US humanitarian aid. Even multi-billionaire British business tycoon Richard Branson was also involved. Help those who are hungry. Um, and today, hopefully, on the back of this uh, concert, uh, we can start maybe getting supplies uh, into Venezuela so that people are not suffering so much. One problem was that the humanitarian aid was already coming into the country from Russia, China, Qatar, Cuba and Turkey. 
Roger Waters, a musician and co-founder of progressive rock band Pink Floyd, is very critical of the forceful attempt to deliver humanitarian aid without the authorization of the Venezuelan government and the role of Richard Branson within this operation. It has nothing to do with freedom and it has nothing to do with aid. It has to do with Richard Branson, and I'm not surprised by this, having bought the US saying, we have decided to take over Venezuela. So what was this all about? Was this a provocation aimed at undermining the Venezuelan government and showing that they were no longer in charge? Or was it an attempt at causing the military to switch allegiances and declare their loyalty to Juan Guaido? Gringo, go home. I went to the Venezuelan border to see for myself. This is Simon Bolivar Bridge. On that side of the bridge is Colombia and on this side of the bridge is Venezuela. It's been an important battleground of late between the Venezuelan army and so-called humanitarian aid volunteers. He has a gun. The border. I didn't realise it at the time. I was walking into a crossfire between the Venezuelan army and the Colombian side of the border where bullets were inches from my head. There was a big controversy over the alleged burning of the humanitarian aid trucks with the leaders of the right-wing coalition of the Lima Group, Washington and the mainstream media all blaming Nicolas Maduro's government and voicing their disgust at what they described as a cowardly act. US Vice President Mike Pence even said, quote, The tyrant in Caracas danced as his henchmen murdered civilians and burned food and medicine heading to Venezuelans. Saturday was tragic for the families of those killed and suffering Venezuelans, but it was just one more day in Venezuela's journey from tyranny to freedom. Maduro must go. Yet, I visited both international border bridges and I saw the so-called humanitarian aid volunteers throwing Molotov cocktails at the Venezuelan army. So it seemed obvious to me that they were the ones most likely behind the humanitarian aid trucks being set on fire. Indeed, the New York Times all but admitted this fact two weeks later. Everyone knew what the so-called humanitarian aid was about, but only when the New York Times told the truth did the rest of the world believe us and believe that it was like what we said, a Trojan horse. My translator, who was meant to meet me on the border, went home because the bus he came in on was attacked by the so-called humanitarian aid volunteer. The screen has been smashed. And this third bus over here has actually been burnt to a point that it's no longer at all usable. Yet that evening, when I went home, I saw this news report. Set that bus on fire to express their outrage over the blocking of humanitarian aid deliveries by President Nicolas Maduro. Let's go to NBC's Mariana Tensio. She's you hear that? The she just justified burning down a bus. It felt like very sympathetic reporting for what could only be described as a politically motivated act of violence. No wonder the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, wanted no part of this so-called humanitarian aid intervention. Here on Santander Bridge, we've got Colombia on that side, Venezuela on that side. Now this is a truck allegedly delivering humanitarian aid. It's been burnt, decimated by so-called humanitarian aid volunteers. Now within this truck, we see whistles and wires. Now, I've got three questions. My first question is this. Why would a truck delivering humanitarian aid have whistles and wires in there? How is that going to help the people of Venezuela? My second question is, does this look like the work of humanitarian aid volunteers? Why would they burn a truck full of food if it was really just about humanitarian aid? And my third and final question is this. When the people of Gaza try to return back to their homes in which they was ethnically cleansed from, the international media call them terrorists and they justify Israeli soldiers shooting them with guns. But here, when trucks like this try to enter a border illegally and the soldiers defend themselves, it's the soldiers that are demonised and the so-called humanitarian aid volunteers that are called the heroes. Why the double standards? Can you answer those questions? 
The whole world seemed to be talking about a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela that I'd so far not seen. So after returning from the border, I went to a children's hospital to see how bad the situation really was. It was clear to me that the hospital was not in great condition. Hace poco. Recently, an Argentinian child died here. He had an aggressive tumour that we could not treat because we didn't have access to radiotherapy. Of course, this affected us all because, as doctors, it's our job to treat patients, and it affected me deeply and my mental health. The obstacles are unfortunate. They impose it on us externally. I know God is watching and we will be victorious on behalf of those who are unfortunately no longer with us. These children are in desperate need of medical supplies that have not arrived from abroad. And some might ask, should these children really bear the brunt of a geopolitical struggle that played no part in? The government blames healthcare issues on the sanctions placed on Venezuela and claims that financial transactions for medical supplies and equipment have been blocked by intermediary banks and financial institutions. I went to speak to the Vice Minister of Health to find out more. As a result of their blockade, we pay 45% more for medicines than they pay in Brazil and Colombia. That means that the country must find even more resources to provide medication to our people. The last payment of the Pan American Health Organization was about $20 million. This wasn't received by them or the country we were buying medicine from, but it was retained, which means over 2.6 million were at risk of not being vaccinated. This money was needed to bring antibiotics, anesthetics, and surgical material to operate on over 180,000 patients. The people of Venezuela have struggled with a lack of access to medical supplies, and this has been widely highlighted by the international mainstream media. However, What's less highlighted is the reasons why they struggle to get medical supplies into the country. Of course, some in Venezuela disagreed with this analysis and felt like it was just an excuse to mask over economic mismanagement and government corruption. The regime of Maduro is the consequence of 14 years of inefficiency. Corruption was from both sides and millions of dollars of the country's wealth was wasted. A lot of money came from all the oil Venezuela had, but that was when oil prices were high. This created the illusion of harmony and wealth, but once the oil prices fell and that money was gone, we were left naked. Not all of the criticism of the government came from the right wing. In 2016, an economic team from the Union of South American Nations, UNESA, presented the Venezuelan government with a report outlining economic recommendations to revitalize the economy, which were never implemented, leading many to conclude that the government was too static in its response to the economic crisis. The hospital I went to had a generator for power shortages, and because of what happened next, that generator was going to become very useful. Between March the 7th and March the 10th of 2019, Venezuela experienced the longest interruption of its electrical system in the country's history. The government alleged that the blackout was the result of sabotage directed against the central computer of the main hydroelectrical power station at El Guri in Bolivar State. Not everyone agreed. This is the consequence of what has been the natural deterioration of public standards. The government departments have become redundant because they don't work to satisfy public needs and public interests, but to satisfy their own pockets. This is the institutional reality, the politics of our country. Some argued that the blackout was conveniently timed. The opposition had called for a protest that Saturday. The announcement had not received the same enthusiasm as before. So many felt the numbers were going to be low and the opposition momentum had gone. The blackout happened on the Thursday, two days before the planned protest. The Cuban-American right-wing senator for Florida, Marco Rubio, was tweeting about the electrical blackout approximately three minutes after the electrical grid went out. Before much of the country, including myself and the Minister of Information, Jorge Rodriguez, had even realised. Rubio's tweet said, Alert! Reports of a complete power outage all across Venezuela at this moment. 18 of 23 states and the capital district are currently facing complete blackouts. Main airport also without power and backup generators have failed. Maduro regime is a complete disaster. 
And they did it, knowing that it would leave Caracas vulnerable, so they sabotaged it. They sabotaged it to cause chaos in our nation. For some, the government and their supporters' claims about it being an act of sabotage was just a wild conspiracy theory. Whilst others online have pointed to the fact that in 2013 the popular video game Call of Duty featured in its storyline the same gurry hydroelectrical dam, in fact part of the mission was to install a virus in the electrical system to generate a blackout. Call of Duty creator Michael Condry said, We brought in a lot of outside help, military advisors, futurologists, we got together with a scenario planner from the Department of Defense who is active in the Pentagon. His job is to think about the future threats and prepare what-if scenarios for the US government. So we asked him, what do you think will be the conflict of tomorrow? Whoever was responsible for the blackout, it was the Venezuelan people that were suffering. And the people at this protest seemed pretty convinced that the incompetence and mismanagement of the Maduro government was behind all of the country's problems, including the blackout. While so many government supporters saw the United States as part of the problem, what I found at the opposition protest was a belief that the administration of Donald Trump was part of the solution. So the people behind me are very loud, very angry and passionate. Let's see what they're so angry and passionate about. Hello. So why are you here? I came to fight for my children, for the liberation of my country, because we are tired. I would like to thank President Trump for all he's doing for the Venezuelan people. Rescue us. Please unite and help us. Rescue us because people here are dying. This is unlike any other protests I've been to in my life where people insult the president's mother and actively call for US intervention. And one thing that they always say is that the government uses sanctions as an excuse to mask over their economic mismanagement and corruption. We, we are human beings and we are trying to build a new model, an economic model as well. So of course we, could, we can have taken some uh, decisions that didn't uh, produce um, some results that we expected. But I can say maybe that's 20% of the responsibility or less. But the main reason that uh, you cannot find something in Venezuela, some products, is because of the blockade. I mean, we are producing oil, but then we, we send the oil and then we cannot get that oil paid back to Venezuela. I mean, that they, they have kidnapped our, our resource. Towards the end of my trip in Venezuela, I felt there was a shift in atmosphere and Western journalists developed a more critical tone towards US policy in Venezuela. And I'm wondering if you really don't see any kind of disconnect or inconsistency with the way the administration treats different groups of displaced, desperate people, because I would imagine if you went to the southern border, a lot of people would have similar stories as to the ones you heard today. There's nothing like what's taking place at the hands of Nicolas Maduro. Juan Guaido's protests also felt like they were getting smaller and smaller, and then this happened. Guaido boldly tried to organize a protest in a working class neighborhood called Al Valle and was chased out by the locals. Guaido and his associates were ironically protected by the same Venezuelan police that he had criticized as being the enforcers of what he calls Maduro's dictatorship. After six weeks in Venezuela, it was obvious to me and to many people on the ground that the US sponsored attempted diplomatic coup had failed, but it didn't mean that the US would give up on its regime change project. We're not considering anything, but all options are on the table. US President Donald Trump and US Vice President Mike Pence had repeatedly said, all options are on the table, which some regarded as a threat of possible military intervention. United States National Security Advisor John Bolton had explained very clearly how important Venezuelan oil is to US economic interests. It'll make a big difference to the United States economically if we could have American oil companies really invest in and, and produce the oil uh, capabilities in uh, Venezuela. During my time in Venezuela, I saw people struggling due to harsh economic sanctions, a move which was formally condemned by the United Nations which the UN itself asked member states not to abide by. I met people critical of the government, and many people supportive of the government, but overall what I witnessed was normal people living their normal lives and a strong sense of community, a complete contrast to the Western media's portrayal of Venezuela.
I've been on a journey over these six weeks to find out if what's been reported on Venezuela is true. And from what I've found, it's been a damning indictment of the mainstream media. Yes, there are legitimate criticisms of the government's response to economic issues. But in my opinion, the title of dictatorship is wholly undeserving for this country. The crisis, from what I've found, has been a result of economic policies led by Washington involving various actors and intermediaries, and the group most affected by these policies, by and large, still support the government. I'm glad for that. 